I'm starting with. Yeah. Good evening, everyone present here. I am Faraz from Clarnet. Clarnet is very proud to be a part of this session as a digital partner. Clarnet is India's largest live digital and doctor generated learning platform. With all of you, I'm presenting a short video on Clarnet. Thank you so much all doctors for watching the video and you all are requested to visit our website www.clarnet.com. We, we have also MedWiki service which is a doctor's medical Wikipedia for doctors only that you can read. By taking not much time, I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Harivan Chopra sir, National President IAPSM. Over to you sir, kindly proceed from here. Thank you, thank you for us. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, my friends. First of all, Aap Sab Ko Ganesh Chaturthi Ki Bahad Bahad Shukkamnaya. And on this auspicious day, we are starting once again with one of our very popular program, which, which we named as Community Medicine Human Library Project, where we invite the luminaries in the field of public health uh, to come and share their experiences, their stories, their vision, and their advice to the youngsters. So they, in this particular series, we already did around 12 sessions last year. And now we are starting again on this auspicious day. And we are starting the session with one of the brightest stars of community medicine in, in, in this country. Of course, he is not in this country. He is joining from abroad right now. But I always call him the brightest star because he has achieved the heights. And before I hand over the mic to Dr. Behel, for his introduction, I will say two lines, which I always say for him. And I, these lines are reserved for him. So I always say these two lines. And with these two lines, I'll be handing over the mic to Professor Behel. Gar tum dekhna chahte ho meri uran ko. Gar tum dekhna chahte ho meri uran ko. To jao, jakar aur uncha karo asman ko. So with these two lines, I hand over the mic to Professor Behel to kindly introduce our one of the brightest star of community medicine, Dr. Arvin Mathur. Over to you, Dr. Behel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and good evening, sir. Uh, before I introduce our luminary of the day, uh, I just want to narrate a few instances. Sir, in fact, uh, I joined this community medicine very late in life at the age of around 38. And I was very regular with all the national conferences. And frankly speaking, sir, you were a craze for all the PGs and for all the senior residents. And we desperately wanted to listen to you. And in one of the conferences, I came across one of my colleagues. She was almost sobbing. When session so, sir, with this statement, I just want to read and um, introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Avin Mathur. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mathur has traveled a lot in his career right from base to the top. If we talk about his college days, he has been a gold medalist from LRRM Medical College Merit. He was the best all round student of the college. He was awarded honorary fellowship of Indian Public Health Association, and he has delivered prestigious orations in NARCH, IPHA, and ISPR. Oh, wow. He's got too many publications in index journals, and he has co-authored many books and chapters. If we talk about his qualifications, he has done DNB in community medicine, DNB maternal and child health, diploma in hospital administration, and he has undergone courses in many, many fields like area development and management from Asian Institute of Management in Philippines. He has also undergone many trainings in negotiation, communication, result-based management, and so on. Before he shifted to WHO, he worked in Aga Khan Foundation 
as health program manager for India and for Bangladesh as well. And he also worked as state coordinator for Care International in Bihar. He also worked as a scientist with the Human Nutrition Unit of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Mathur has been associated with WHO for more than two decades, and he has served at various levels. He has served at regional and country offices in technical leadership, strategic and policy support positions. He has been WHO representative to Maldives. There he also served as UN resident coordinator. He has been acting WHO representative to Sri Lanka. He has been deputy WHO representative and public health administrator in Bangladesh. He has also worked as regional medical officer for MCH at SCRO. He was medical officer, family and community health in DPR Korea and national cluster coordinator for FCH in India. He has been actively involved in upstream policy advocacy, strategic development, program management, relationship building, partnership development, and technical assistance to the member states within the region and beyond. At global, regional, and country level, he has been an active contributor as a member on various expert groups and task force, te task force teams to facilitate and support some path-breaking reforms. He is involved in formulation and implementation of technical guidelines, especially in mother and child health, adolescent health, and reproductive health. In short, we can simply say that he is a results-oriented leader a strong team player. He encourages initiative, promotes open communication and transparency. He helps to accelerate progress towards sustainable gains through healthcare diplomacy and leadership. So on behalf of all the audience, we extend a very warm welcome to you on our ambitious human library project. So, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Behel. Can you kindly stop sharing your screen so that we can move further into the program? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a glimpse of what he has been able to do, say, over a approximately three decades of his career in, in public health. So, now I will be handing over, without much ado, I will be, I'll not come in between you and him, and I'll be giving the screen to Dr. Arvind Mathur for his opening statement and Over to you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you so very much, uh, sir, Dr. Chopra and Dr. Behel. Uh, it's truly a privilege and honor uh, and really overwhelming experience to join uh, this human library project, which is such a wonderful initiative that IAPSM under your dynamic leadership has uh, initiated. So my first heartiest congratulations to you, uh, to Dr. Behel and the office bearers of the IAPSM uh, for really thinking out of box and bringing the, the stalwarts, uh, the experienced people uh, and some humble and uh, the people who are still public health learner like myself uh, on this uh, screen and on this platform also. Uh, let me also join you, sir, in extending the uh, warmest wishes on the occasion of Ganesh Chaturthi. Uh, and one did not realize when you and I spoke about a possible date uh, that it would be done on such an auspicious day. Uh, Ganesha, uh, the Anubhuti, the uh, Anokha uh, experience, the Sarv Pratham Pratham Poojaniye, uh, I think all of us bow to Ganesha uh, for uh, really being with us and being in our uh, lakhni, as we say, uh, because in the field that we, we are, it is so very important to have that blessings uh, of Master Saraswati and Lord Ganesha to be the lighting force for us uh, in our endeavor to, you know, like continue to contribute to improving the lives of the uh, several hundred millions of people 
that we will come across collectively uh, as public health practitioners and public health learners. So in terms of uh, the opening thing, in terms of the opening statement, uh, let me first uh, turn around and say something uh, for, uh, for you, uh, especially who has been a guide, mentor, friend, philosopher, uh, and the one who has shaped uh, not only people like me, uh, but many more and many, many uh, uh, several. And it's not only to you, sir, to be fair, uh, it's all to the teachers. Because one of the things which I say always, uh, teaching in public health is one of the most glamorous side of the public health. Uh, one which has the biggest opportunity to shape uh, the minds of the young people, the young scientists, the young academicians, the young innovators, and, and the young achievers. So, aapne do line mere liye kahi, sir, do line mein aap ke liye aur baaki logon ke liye kehta hoon. Akbar Elabadi ka share hai, sir, ki log kehte hai, badalta hai zabana sabko. Log kehte hai, badalta hai zamana sabko, aap wo hai, jo zamane ko badal dalte hai. And sir, this is absolutely true because we are participating in one of uh, the very innovative project, and I am aware about the number of initiatives uh, that currently are underway uh, in the field of uh, public health and the IAPSM, the body that all of us so lovingly belong to and look up to. And Dr. Bell, you, your words have been so humbling uh, and, and so encouraging and motivating to me. Uh, in terms of that, if I have made that influence on, on even one young person uh, and one yellow, uh, young fellow public health practitioner, um, I feel uh, very honored and I feel very fulfilled. Uh, and that's been, the, that's been the learning, that's been the journey, that's been the journey uh, as a learner, as, as a development professional, as a manager, and as a leader, that one could actually make more leaders. Uh, and that's something which is what one continues to try, one continues to put in. Uh, sir, in terms of, uh, you know, like way forward for us to continue the interaction, uh, I, I mean, I would be more than happy to share experiences. I would be more than happy to, uh, you know, like share perspectives from the point of view of both the work that one can do uh, in any settings that one is and the way that one can work at a national, at a regional, at a country, or at a sub-national level, but to still contribute to the global health, is still contribute to the international health. Uh, I just wanted to one more time profusely thank you and every teacher of mine, sir, uh, and remember and pay my most respectful regards, homage, and remembrances to some of uh, our very close mentors who may not be physically present with us in the world today, but that is something which I feel uh, their blessings, their guidance uh, is always with us. Uh, with that, sir, I would uh, only say that I am very willing to contribute in any way that we can in this uh, uh, particular session and interact with the participants who are online. So thank you so very much, uh, sir, one more time uh, for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, uh, I would be more than happy to learn from every one of uh, the colleagues who are on on the screen today. Thank you, sir, and over to you, first. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Arvind, for a uh, wonderful opening statement, and uh, we highly appreciate your uh, emotions and feelings. And yes, I fully agree with you that yes, whatever we have become today is again because of the guidance and the mentorship which we got from our teachers. And yes, uh, it is it is uh, one of the very very lucrative aspect in public health. But then. Uh, in changing times, there are so many options in which one can go. So I think it will be appropriate that if we start from your beginning, basically, that uh, could you please tell us something about your childhood, then something about your MBBS, then why did you decide to join uh, MD in Community Medicine? Was it by choice or was it by default? So these are three questions which I'm putting to you right now. Uh, thank you so very much, sir. I mean, very interesting and enticing uh, in a way to go back uh, memory lane. Uh, 
I, I was actually born um, uh, in a city of Muzaffarnagar uh, with my parents, uh, you know, like being uh, uh, my father being in the central government job, uh, retired as the commissioner uh, customs and central excise, belonged to a big family of uh, six siblings together, uh, spent my childhood in different cities, sir. And in the older times, this is, this is I consider as an advantage because settling in and desettling in a short period of time gives you a, a kind of a level of resilience. And I think uh, the seeds were sown in uh, from the time that uh, one was born. Uh, when I was three years, my father was transferred and we moved from the city of uh, Muzaffarnagar to city of Saharanpur. From the city of Saharanpur, sir, I could actually uh, then got transferred my father and I was transferred again uh, to city of Modinagar. And finally, we landed up in Meerut. And the reason I am sharing this kind of journey, sir, because the, the travel and, trans, uh, and seeing the different cities, interacting with the people of different places itself is a great learning. And if that gets started in the childhood, I mean, I don't mean to say that the people who are not getting transferred or traveling, they cannot have learning. But this becomes an advantage if I reflect back uh, in the past. And since my father's last posting was in Meerut, uh, it so happens because of the various circumstances. I mean, uh, my father being a very diehard, honest uh, uh, public health, uh, I mean, uh, public servant, uh, you know, it was decided that it is best because my uh, sisters were getting married. They were already married. That I stay back with my younger sister, with my parents. And this was a privilege, and I would say a God's blessing, that uh, I was then, despite having been selected at that time through the pre-medical tests in many other colleges, uh, it was uh, destined that I joined Meerut Medical College uh, for my MBBS. And as luck would have had it, sir, I mean, the year I joined was the year that uh, you joined as the faculty of uh, PSM in our college as well. And the journey started, sir, in Meerut Medical College um, with the background of my school and uh, like from the childhood. The one thing which was part and parcel of our upbringing was, sir, not only the studies. It was always with the overall development that our parents encouraged us to participate in every co-curricular or extracurricular activities. So from the childhood, sir, I was in the third standard when for the first time uh, studying in a Hindi medium school throughout of my uh, schooling days, that in third standard, I delivered my first speech in English uh, on the Republic Day in the Montessori school that I was studying in Saranpur. Uh, from that time, the fear of stage and facing the people was kind of taken care of. To the extent that the exposure to the literature when my eldest sister was studying and doing her uh, master of education, she was actually doing her research on Sri Aurobindo. And I used to read the magazine which she used to receive called uh, Agni Shikha. And I was so enamored with the whole uh, magazine, the, the booklet that used to come, that in the fourth standard, I went to my class teacher and I said, please change my name to Aurobindo. So I started uh, imbibing some of those values through my elder siblings and my, uh, you know, idol, my brother. Uh, and, you know, some of these things came up. Uh, and as one grew, uh, both in terms of the uh, literary uh, exposure as well as the sports, uh, I had the opportunity to be encouraged by my parents as well as by my siblings. Uh, despite having very limited resources, we were in a position to make the best use of the resources by sharing the uh, amongst the siblings and also amongst the friends. Uh, going through this, sir, it was in Meerut uh, uh, in studying in the government inter college. Uh, that's the time when um, you know it was uh, very clear from the childhood in my mind that I'm going to go into medicine. And certainly at that point of time, the aspiration to become a doctor was not to be linked with the public health. It was that I would be a doctor and I would be treating people. I would be, uh, you know, like taking care of the sufferings and that compassion, care, uh, feeling and uh, thought was very much within me. 
the journey of MBBS, sir, uh, has been one uh, which actually shapes you in terms of uh, your thinking, in terms of the way that you would become a human being, uh, the way that our college, uh, and thank you for having this as the background uh, in your screen, sir, uh, because that reminds and rekindles the memory. Uh, ninth day of my admission, sir, I was called by my seniors uh, of the second year and my professor did not allow me to leave the lecture theater because he felt that I would be ragged. But they had come to the lecture theater to ask me to come to go to the principal, sir, because the medical college wanted to send a team to Pulse in 85 for the sports uh, activities, particularly the badminton, uh, that is what we wanted to represent ourselves with. So I started getting the exposure thanks to my seniors who knew that I play uh, some games, the badminton being my favorite that I have played throughout uh, the schooling days as well as through the college days. And I started getting that exposure. Attending Pearls within that short period of time was a revelation, sir because it just gave you the exposure of the kind of talent that is there in, in the medical fraternity itself. The, not only in the sports, but the literary events that I attended, the college, the corridors, the interactions that uh, we have had with the people and the students. So there was that uh, kind of a impression in the mind of what overall personality uh, development would and should be. And then, sir, the inherent uh, intent and interest on one side to do well in the uh, studies and on the other side, uh, be, you know, like uh, work hard and party harder. So it's the philosophy where one looked into that uh, uh, you would have to explore the avenues and opportunities uh, for extracurricular and co-curricular activities while you are doing it. I very soon became uh, the secretary of the Anatomy Society as well. And from then, uh, it was a journey where from one society to the other and working under your guidance and your leadership, not only looking into the, uh, the academic side of it, where one had always aspired to excel and by God's grace and with the blessings of my parents and the guidance of all teachers, I've had the pleasure of doing pretty well throughout my MBBS journey uh, that Dr. Rakesh Bell was so very kindly uh, showing in the slide about uh, the recognition that one had been able to get uh, while one has been in the uh, college during MBBS days, sir. I just had such an eventful MBBS time, sir. Uh, and the, the medical college made it during those between, I would say, 85 to 95 had been one of the most happening places and one of the most happening medical colleges in the whole fraternity, I would say, uh, not only in the academic rankings, but sir, even in the sports, that when we revived uh, the, the Shivraj Memorial Cricket Tournament and the Rakesh Memorial Double Wicket Tournament, a very innovative thing in terms of uh, looking into a double wicket tournament kind of a thing, to sir, reviving the Medi Night, which got stopped because of the, uh, the blast that we had in our multi-purpose hall, to be able to convince you first, and then to support us to go and convince the principal and other faculty that we can do a disciplined uh, cultural program and to be able to be involved in, um, sir, on one side, uh, academic uh, conferences, but also on the other side, the strikes that took place in medical colleges on those days, sir, to uh, the challenges that were there to convince the faculty that examinations need to be postponed. So I had had the pleasure and privilege or the rare experience of experiencing this such a myriad uh, kind of uh, events and activities that I believe I was able to learn and being resilient to these changes and be able to cope up with the pressures uh, on one side of managing a big festival where we had 23 universities participating in an NSS youth festival to like 13 university medical colleges participating in the cricket tournament to the stimulus that we led to three days event or a four days event 
all of those things sir made me feel that were learnings uh, that made my job or my task in the years to come much 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 easier the most important question sir that everybody asks me as well uh, what you said is that did you get into uh, md community medicine by choice or by chance or you know like how did it happen or why did it happen destiny certainly plays an important role sir but one thing is that if you have a clarity of purpose i think sir the destiny uh, comes to help you uh, kind of make your path i had been a die hard uh, honest you know committed person a committed student to get into pediatrics and work for child health sir that's been one thing which was very clear i started off my uh, house job whether i did it in uh, in in delhi focused on pediatrics sir. i would have got into pediatrics but as luck would have had it we got a competition and as the situation happened for variety of reasons in my family circumstances or for whatever purpose reasons i probably wouldn't have got in my first attempt the diploma i would have got rather than an md but most importantly sir there were two turning points for me when i decided that i would not pursue child health uh, either diploma or md particularly when i was in my delhi experience in the safdarjang hospital where i realized one thing sir it's fine i can manage and i can treat so many children here but 90% of these kids need not to be in this hospital sir and i for sure got that clarity with me that as a person practicing pediatrics in the clinical field or in the private will not be able to make that change i needed to be somewhere else and for that reason sir i said if i am going to be changing my branch i need to think which branch could it be and as it happened sir that the whole idea at that point of time to remain this dilemma which i believe many youngsters even today have is it a clinical para clinical or a non clinical i would say public health is a domain which is a mix of all and i believe it has the most uh, rich or enriching uh, domain that can provide you experiences and expertise across any of these uh, three domains if we are talking about there was a time when i had even thought because of the nature that i have or because of the work that i have been doing during my graduation as well as uh, otherwise that i could have gone into psychiatry also but then at that point of time for again when i had interacted with my professors with my teachers including yourself sir but thanks to thanks to uh, many uh, of my interactions with you but also with other teachers that i realized that my decision to join the preventive and social medicine would actually take me uh you know like the way that i have been thinking about uh, changing the the scenario if i have to and make different contributions uh in the field of the overall health and the quality of life of people and children in particular uh so to that extent i would say it had been a very conscious and by choice decision to join public health and continue and persist and not even think about preparing again to up, to kind of appear in competitions and give uh, the competition to get into any other branch sir the this was sir i could say in terms of a very conscious very accepted and a decision which i could say made me love my speciality and made me confident of the decision that i have taken and sir subsequently in a few years later i could say that this could get reaffirmed and it could get vindicated by the actions that i was able to take or even till today that i am able to take that i feel so very uh, so very i would say contented to some extent while the fire is still burning in the belly to do more but there has been so many things that i have been able to do because i chose to be in the field of public health community medicine or preventive and social medicine and whatever sir so i would say sir since then the 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 self esteem the confidence of joining the public health 
and uh, kind of making sure that uh, there is this purpose of be, uh, you know, like strive for excellence and then uh, be better every time for everything. The opportunities of learning that public health provides, the community medicine provides are unparalleled. And I learned so much both during MBBS while studying at PSM and while doing my MD and other uh, degrees and trainings that I have done, sir. So long answer for a short question, sir. But if I can give and say choice, yes. Destiny, big time, sir. But unless and until these two come together, uh, you would not be able to give the best in terms of uh, the outcomes. So start loving your brand. It's a great speciality. Uh, strive for excellence. Do everything to be, be better, sir. That's my motto. Just follow these two words, be better, and you will, you will just excel in everything, sir. So this is something which I would kind of share and stop here, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I understand that, yes, you, you finished your MD in 1995. And from 95 to 2022, it's 27 year journey. And you have seen uh, the different aspects as far as the uh, public health is concerned. You worked here, you worked in Bihar, and then you worked in Aga Khan, and then you joined, ultimately joined WHO. So uh, the question which is there is that, uh, and you were in India, you were in DPR Korea, you were in Bangladesh, you were in Sri Lanka, you were in Maldives, and now you are in uh, Timor Leste. So, so it's it's a it's a it's a big big journey. So, <clears throat> what do you think uh, has been the the three four major challenges for you in these uh, uh, twenty seven years? Uh, so, to be honest, if I start from the very very early days, sir. Uh, one thing, sir, which is very important in terms of the challenge, sir, uh, and I believe this may be still true for uh, many young people that they are uh, there, sir, in terms of the way that we need to learn, sir. Today's learning opportunities are very, very different. And I would say that today's young generation is very privileged, sir. But had it not been, sir, the, 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 the first thing which came to my mind when I was in the department of PSM and being the only student as MD in that particular year, I was very clear, sir, in one thing that the biggest challenge for me is to decide what, uh, what kind of learnings I would want and how would I excel in those ones, sir. And also the challenge sir, at that time was because there were limited avenues and limited opportunities uh, was very early understanding. And I had given this message to many of my uh, fellow colleagues and uh, uh, young professionals as well. that if age is not on your side, let the qualification be. <clears throat> and that is what, sir, I <clears throat> decided that I would actually be then doing some concurrent parallel online distance education uh, programs as well while I was doing MD. The challenge, the first challenge in that regard certainly was to grab any opportunity where one can do something at the ground level, at the field levels, and learn from it. So be it, sir, the surveys that department was doing, and proactively approaching head of the department to all of you, sir, all the faculty members. And I must say, sir, with a lot of gratitude and a lot of uh, humility that I have been actually mentored like uh, by you people, uh, like the Kumar does it to the Ghada, sir. So every teacher of mine just threw me uh, into the field and to say, okay, manage it now, sir. So be it the first lecture at times, sir, or a demonstration to a survey in the field or doing the a &M trainings or, sir, encouraging me to do uh, publications while I was still doing MD or encouraging me to grab the opportunity when it was an international conference sir, that I could get and get and work to get the sponsorship even to participate in a conference and make a presentation there 
and get the uh, out of the world experience altogether. So the first challenge, sir, I could say, uh, started earlier during the academic life itself, which was uh, the way I expressed it, sir. The second challenge was a very tough decision, sir. Tough decisions are the reason I'm saying, as I started off by saying that I still consider teaching uh, in the community medicine as one of the most uh, on one side glamorous side, but also one of the biggest learning experiences uh, in the field of medical fraternity, sir. So to say no to teaching and something which I loved throughout, sir, even during my MBBS days, sir, I used to have classes of my juniors in the pathology museum or even otherwise my physiology notes and all of those things, sir. To the extent that uh, in MD, when I used to take uh, opportunity of the classes, I just loved it, sir. And to decide that, no, this is the reason, sir, for that, why I'm sharing this challenge, to say no to something which you really like, sir. And you could have easily been into that stream and decide a path which was uncertain, which was not really many examples and with less guidance that would be there is what I decided to choose. And that's where, sir, I must say my exposure at the Human Nutrition Unit and with Professor Kapil, whom I am so grateful that he decided to accept and to say, okay, for a short time also, you are, you can come and you do the work. And I started about this thing because in the, my final MD exam and hats off and uh, bow to Professor Devki Nandan and Professor Muhammad Yunus, sir, who even asked me this question. And I said, sir, I am going to be in international health. I would go into that. And they were like, say, why? What, what is this? Because that was not something that generally would be a kind of a line chosen by a young MD student at that time, sir. So, sir, when I decided on to or overcome these two challenges, any other challenge to surmount was much lesser, actually. But little did I realize, sir, that soon after the HNU, the experience, when I joined uh, the International Health, and luckily, uh, when I appeared in the interviews and all, and I was offered the care international position, uh, I went for a position in Delhi. And uh, the then program manager, she said, who was from US and very good friend of mine, she said, I have a higher position in Bihar, and I know you will just do great there. So I said, but why should I go to Bihar? You know, like of all the states in the country, why should I go to Bihar? But sir, that is where I would say the resilience that I have learned, the experience and the uh, kind of uh, learnings that you people have given to me and what I have embraced and absorbed gave me a confidence and a voice, go and explore, sir. Sir, experience in Bihar during those years in itself is a story that I can run for a few hours, sir. Having done in a, in a, in a state where there was law and order an issue, starting a first nutrition and health program of Care International, which was entering into health domain for the first time in their 40-year existence. And having achieved a lot of things as first in Bihar, overcoming those challenges, sir, even to protect Anganwadi workers for the pilferage of the corn soya bland and the refined vegetable oil was a struggle, sir, because I was protecting the Anganwadi workers, which the director sitting in Patna office would want to penalize, to bringing the concepts of training about ARI, about diarrheal disease, getting the diarrheal disease unit established in the health centers, to Sir, making them learn about integrated management. The whole trial was I coordinated at that time with WHO, uh, CRO, regional office in Bihar, uh, as one of the states to do that, sir. Challenges cropped up, sir, many. My field officer were abducted by communists, uh, by, by the Marxist people, sir, the Nexalite people. To manage that kind of a situation, to have two female coordinators and they are driving on the Nexalite areas and ensuring their protection and is still achieving the nutrition and the health indicators. And in health indicators, sir, the Bihar offered us so much challenges and opportunities. We committed for a measles vaccine coverage to go from the then 17% to 
to 65% with measles supply not available in the state for last two years. Iron folic acid, same way. So sir, that gave me an opportunity to overcome the challenge by policy dialogue. Sir. That's where I learned. I was under the tree on one day in the villages of Bihar. And the next day I was sitting with the joint secretary and the secretary of health in the Patna to negotiate these things. sir. And that range of experience, that range of activities and learning is only possible in community medicine. sir. But yes, you have to be willing to be uh, in the field and understand the challenge, read the challenge, accept it, and then try and surmount it, sir. So another challenge that I could say is also always happens is, uh, is with regard to the changes that one makes in the career and whether you are willing to continue to learn, sir. And the reason I am saying, sir, I had to, because of the, again, some personal circumstances, I had to take a decision to leave KR Bihar and try and make an attempt to come to Delhi. Around the same time, sir, when the polio project was launched in India by WHO. And I had the standing offer to join the polio project. And I said, no, I do not wish to join the national polio surveillance project at that point of time. And I actually gone into the Aga Khan Foundation only because of one reason, sir, that provided me a growth opportunity to learn more. I would work in health systems. I would then work in the area of uh, environmental and sanitation. And it would give me opportunity to uh, open up my faculties and to learn a new thing, sir, area development and put them into uh, practice. That was the time, sir, first time that I developed the area development program and a approach which is called, which we named it, I named it as SHED, Sustainable Health and Education Economic Development. And we developed that for Mewat area, sir. So there have been these decisions that one would have to make, sir. And I had overcome those challenges. And for such challenges, sir, that I am sharing with you, one big support that is needed is from the family, sir. And I would say that support, from, particularly from my spouse, my wife, Dr. Niketa, uh, has been exemplary. Because, sir, you can't make those changes if you don't have that kind of a support. And to say, fine, it's okay, go ahead, explore this further, we will do it together. I think that plays a very important role, sir. And that's where I would say that as a fourth challenge that I, I can certainly make it. And then to say that uh, you would continue to have that challenge about the areas where you would look and you would sit in a meeting and you say what these people are talking about because I know nothing about it. Because though those terminologies are like we start talking about medical terminology to a non-medical person and the development field is sometime like that, sir. When I first started learning about management of environmental resources by communities, I was saying like, what the, what the hell it is? Well, like, why should I learn about environmental resources? I might have just been good somewhere else, but that's public health, sir. That's what gives us the opportunity to overcome those hesitation, to overcome those, uh, you know, like kind of a inhibitions inside to explore the unknown is what is a very important challenge that all of us have to overcome every now and then, sir. So journey continued in terms of challenges and getting into WHO. I'm sure that there, there would be, I saw that there are many questions like, how do you get into WHO, uh, into international agencies and so and so forth, sir. But one thing which I could say, sir, that's where, as Dr. Behel said, that he and I would have probably met during one of those conferences, uh, the national conferences, uh, whether IAPSM, international conferences, public health, any other that one gets nowadays, so many opportunities. Uh, it's very important, sir, your work speaks for you. Uh, it was a conference where I made a presentation on alternate health financing and alternate health financing for maternal health, sir. And the session was chaired by the then WHO representative who handpicked me from there, sir. He said, we are going to announce a position very soon and we would wish you to apply. And I said, no. I'm not interested to come to WHO. I'm very happy in what I am doing. He said, Dr. Arvind, we will come back to you once things are all sorted out, we will see. So down one year time, things changed in the Aga Khan Foundation, the way that we were working, the management change and all, there were challenges within, within this, what we call as organizational development challenges, sir. 
So I said, fair enough. And then I was, there was an advertisement announcement and there was a competition. They were like, so fine, I applied for it and went through it, had the option of joining uh, the regional office, but decided with my heart core, heart in India, didn't wish to move out of India in those years. Sir. So I had said all no to overseas position. I said, if I could make a contribution to India, and if I don't, that's so not good. I am not looking for lucrative things all the time. I need to first make contribution to India before I say, yes, I can move out. Sir. So that is the fifth or sixth challenge that I could say. Decision to, to stay or go is yours. But stick to it, sir. Overcome that decision. Uh, overcome that challenge, which is what, what I did, sir. Within the WHO, so there are hundreds of challenges. Sir. Or every organization has challenges. Every organization has its own dynamics. How do you not stagnate? How do you continue to grow, sir? How do you continue to avail opportunities? And one thing, sir, which repeatedly come in between is your networking and relationship building. So that is a challenge. It's a skill. It is something which I would always encourage everyone to be practicing subtle or, or, or overt or in one way or the other. I think it's extremely important that one needs to work and overcome that inhibition also. Networking relationship matters. Sir. And in WHO, sir, the journey has not been easy. We are a, a member country organization. Uh, we do have different uh, uh, kind of challenges, which is uh, uh, even within the organization, the growth is not easy. One would have to really work hard and overcome the challenge, even tough postings. Sir. Neither DPR Korea was an easy posting, nor Timor Leste is, sir. But those decisions and those challenges have to be over, have to be faced, strategized, uh, and then move forward on to those. Sir. So I think seven or eight challenges are instead of three, four. But uh, but just to share some of those perspectives. Sir. Yeah, I know. I know you have a lot more stories to share. <laughs> Uh, your career is concerned and uh, since you were talking about measles and uh, yes we decided long time back that we will listen to your story <clears throat> you were in maldives and you could achieve <clears throat> measles elimination in maldives so would you like to share <clears throat> or how could you do it because i think that is uh, that will be interesting from the uh, point <clears throat> of all public health professionals that yes of course, it's a small country, but again, <clears throat> achieving elimination of needles in a small country is not a, a small job. It's a very big job. So what is that story? Will you like to share in a few minutes? Of course, yeah. I am glad. <laughs> yeah, the stories are too big and complex and uh, they, they can be shared. Mm -hmm. but I repeat a few things like you said that, yes, it is important to understand that I always say that when you are a young postgraduate, Always develop a habit of saying yes, take all opportunities. Don't miss any opportunity, number one. Number two, as you said, as you grow in your career, the support of the family is very, very important. That message must go down because you see, nowadays things are moving in a different direction also. And uh, there are gender specific issues also. A lot of females are joining the community medicine and they want to do well. But if they have to do well, they have to understand that they can't be limited to one particular place if they want to work in public health. So challenges will be there and the support of the family is very, very important. So these two points I just wanted to uh, recapitulate so that the message goes down to all the public health professionals. Now, over to you for your uh, measles elimination experience. Sure, sir. I mean, just before the measles elimination, the point which you said, sir, saying yes is very important, sir, from a learning point of view. I remember, sir, in WHO India, when I joined, uh, one day we were sitting with the WHO representative, my supervisor, and uh, we were sitting together for our team meeting, and he says, who would look after traditional medicine? Because there was no national coordinator officer for traditional medicine. So then I said, okay, if nobody is interested, I will pick it up, sir. I'll take it up. I'll take the responsibility of traditional medicine. Today, sir, I can proudly say that uh, India has the knowledge hub established by WHO with the government of India ready to invest $250 million. Uh, whatever little contribution directly, indirectly that was done, 
I can feel very proud because I said yes on that day where we could have even bringing the modern medicine, modern science uh, and research methodologies to some of the, uh, the Central Council of Research in Ayurveda, in Siddha, in homeopathy, Yunani medicine, worked with some of the great scientists in the field of traditional medicine, including Patanjali, sir. So I would reiterate this point, sir, that one, as a young public health professional, one should try to say yes as much as possible, sir. Coming to the measles story, sir, uh, leadership matters. First, I would say, sir, the leadership, why I'm saying, because it is the vision of my regional director, sir, Dr. Poonam Ketrapal Singh, who said in, the, um, in her vision, she decided seven flagships, sir. And one of the flagship was elimination of measles and rubella. And it was because building on to the successes of polio, uh, uh, in the region, sir, when she took over the 2014, when she took over as regional director, the first disease that was certified to be eliminated was polio from the Southeast Asia region, sir. So experience was, sir, that if we continue with the, you know, like given the successes with the measles coverage, measles vaccination coverage or MR coverage, there would be a possibility that we will not have cohort of unvaccinated children and we could actually interrupt the transmission. You are absolutely right, sir. It might sound small country. Uh, it could be easy, but it's an island country with 1,200 islands, 200 are inhabited, more than uh, 170 uh, resorts in a country which is so porous with the expatriate population and all. There, is, there were huge challenges, sir. And the first challenge comes from the fact, sir, you have to mobilize the political will, sir. You have to convince the, uh, the policy makers that it is possible. Ultimately, sir, it is them who are going to agree to invest. The vaccine needs to be procured, sir, if we are doing a campaign. If we are doing a campaign, people need to be mobilized, sir. I need to provide support to the uh, people to travel by speedboat between the islands, sir. And it couldn't have been done if we did not have the other capacity like for lab testing or if we did not have the technical know-how and support from our regional office. So, sir, in terms of the way that we did it, we, having had that leadership uh, vision of measles rubella elimination as one of our eight flagship areas, it gave us the impetus that we can talk with the policymakers in the Maldives Building on the other eliminations, sir. Actually, in 2015, we were lucky. We got certification of uh, malaria elimination. So there is a book that is there, uh, which is edited by RD and Springer uh, as a public uh, publication. We have three pub three chapters in that book from Maldives. One of them I co-authored, sir, on malaria. The other one was lymphatic filariasis in 2017, sir. The whole preparation of this MR campaign, sir, was through the most meticulous planning. And again, sir, the thing which I would keep saying, sir, planning, where does it come from? Maybe from a chapter that nobody studies and reads, if I refer to one of the most popular book of Park. When it comes to the health system planning and all, that chapter nobody reads, nobody teaches. So, or used to, it might have changed. And that is where, sir, my learning with the foundation, Aga Khan Foundation was, when we brought the primary health care Management Advancement Program module, the PHC MAP module, the whole result framework, the whole result chain, all of that. Sir. Those learnings help you to have a policy dialogue with the minister and then go take the minister to go to the president, convince them, have a discussion with the finance minister to make sure the investments are there with the assured backup that the, the technical support is going to be available. For a country, sir, which was already sustaining high level of measles coverage around 97 and 98, there were here and there, there were challenges because of the import that would happen. So we needed to ensure through a meticulous planning, sir. For this purpose, sir, we took almost one year, sir, for a preparation, making sure every document record in every island health center is impeccable, sir. We had invested heavily on ensuring not only the, the child get vaccinated, but has the records. 
the documentation, the record keeping, as well as the system monitoring of the, the, in, the, the flow of information back and forth, sir. When we were internally with the leadership of Ministry of Health, we could convince ourselves that we are really prepared as per the guidebook of WHO, what it takes to go for elimination. We did mock exercises, sir. We did mock drills. And mock drills are, again, these are the principles which we learn in our day-to-day -day during our MD and in post-MD experience and work, sir. And to convince a policymaker, you need to have that conviction that it will work, sir. We put all of that in a plan with my regional office colleagues. And then we did the visit of the first uh, focus visit of uh, uh, the, the regional measles verification committee, sir. The chair of that committee made a, made a visit, sir, to, to look into uh, what is happening, whether he would be in a position to recommend to the commission for a verification visit, sir. He was a person from America who came who is the chair of the Commission of Southeast Asia region. So the learning, sir, and the way that we could go about, on one side, we ensured high coverage, no stockouts, impeccable cold chain, looked into the health uh, information system, look into adverse event following immunization, look into all the plans that may be needed if there is an adverse event, all health facility with the emergency response. Every center, every health center, sir, had an emergency response should there be any adverse event following immunization, sir. Every center. Looking all of those aspects, sir, and then in 2017, we, uh, the, the uh, National Verification Committee chair made a presentation uh, to the Regional Verification Commission when they came, they verified, looked into it, and still, sir, they said that there would be, there has to be a post-elimination outbreak response plan. Because, sir, once we decide that it is eliminated, even a one case of measles is an outbreak. And that's exactly what happens, sir, in 2020, just the year the COVID started, that we had one case of measles reported in the adjoining city of Male, called Hulu Male, and we had to do an immediate outbreak response. We had, we had activated the Health Emergency Operations Center and around the time that the COVID thing was happening, sir. So this is what I could say, huge commitment on the part of the government and the Ministry of Health, sir. And I would say the leadership uh, of the health minister at that point of time and my ability to stand and support and to convince with him the president uh, and make sure that the investments are there and for me to mobilize both technical, financial and also human resources to support this whole process. And again, sir, I think uh, we keep saying what it is very important, publish or perish, sir. It's extremely important to look into some of these things from an angle of publication as well, sir. And, and that's what we did. We make all of those things. And brilliant uh, technical teams are at a national level at WHO country office that I have, uh, though my medical officer and my technical national officer, the way they worked with the Ministry of Health, was possible for us to achieve measles uh, vaccination. COVID has really made it very challenging, sir. Even in Timor-Leste, which we were able to achieve elimination, uh, we have now the glitches. We have the uh, measles coverage, vaccination coverage in all countries have come down by 20%. RD's vision and the flagship was measles rubella elimination by 2020, uh, which we had to change to 2023. And we do hope that we are able to sustain the countries which are certified for elimination are able to sustain. In Maldives, sir, we could also achieve actually rubella control first, then rubella elimination. We also were able to do the elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis uh, that was also certified. And we were just ready to go into control of um, uh, hepatitis in under five population uh, when the COVID came and that got deferred actually and would be done in the years to come. And here in Timor-Leste, sir, we are now working on elimination of neglected tropical diseases, especially yours. India is the only country in the world which has eliminated yours, sir, and Timor-Leste probably could become the second one. And also working towards elimination and certification for lymphatic filaris is here as well, sir. So elimination is an exciting thing, but my heart has always been in maternal, newborn, and child health. 
and i have always been saying one thing sir that communicable diseases or infectious diseases have a new story to tell every time yesterday it was measles then hepatitis hiv then tb and now covid and monkey pox tomorrow there would be some other maternal health is a tragedy that gets neglected all the time sir we have no new story we let mothers die and it's painful sir because that was my learning sir from my work in the foundation when i recommitted myself to maternal and newborn health and i worked extensively in that areas so while i am very excited about elimination it's like clinical practice versus the real public health sir so maternal health is still remain public health more elimination is more kind of uh, tangible deliverable specific and one can really find uh, the you know satisfaction of being involved in the elimination or eradication of diseases sir yeah yeah just, just taking you back to the beginning of your talk when you were talking about it that either you keep on treating or you prevent and then from prevention to control and control to elimination that there is no need and that is the the satisfaction if you are working in the field of public health that you derive that okay you have been able to make a change a change for the betterment and uh, making the place where you are working a better place for living and better place for survival for for everyone and of course i know that you worked a lot in the maternal health as well as in in uh, in newborn child health because we have done number of sessions with you uh, if i go back uh, say in the in the decade of 2001 or 2 to 2010 we did number of sessions in the ipsm conferences on on and you were the one who always used to push me being a pediatrician i used to say why you are pushing me into maternal health it is not my domain and you used to say sir kuch naya kariye na kuch naya karte jo maza aayega wo to child health to aap kar hi rahe ho aapka domain hai so so that way yes i understand yes that is one area and even one maternal death is is a painful experience and it should not be there and i remember that we did a session in ipha uh, conference in kolkata probably that was the south east asian public health conference uh, where again you you sponsored a session uh, through who on maternal health so so yes there there are unlimited stories and i hope uh, dr rakesh must be uh, waiting impatiently to ask you a few more questions which which are there but then i just wanted to bring it in a in a right kind of context for the people to understand that uh, which i always say and i will take your opinion also that if you are working in public health because this question was asked from me also that uh, if you are working in public health how do you develop the passion so what is your take can you work without passion in public health? sir i believe that uh, one cannot work without passion in any fraternity sir in any of the specialty sir uh, that's what i meant sir that uh, we need to love our specialty sir in whatever one sir i don't say if i am a i have friends sir who love being radiotherapists sir in our time sir who would go to radiotherapy sir but i know sir people who have just shown i mean like they are just shining star sir in terms of the work just because they loved it sir they they just had the passion uh, to do and excel and kind of say it is something they are still able to bring that benefit to the uh, to the people sir uh, because sir i would say sir passion is something which is uh, which is the which is what i said that the fire is still burning in the belly sir that has to be there sir whether it is uh, sir the passion is that if a child is playing something and you start playing with him or her uh, and you start you know like that's something which is a passion for me to really spend time if i can so i believe sir passion is important uh, for any fraternity for any speciality for any work uh, and to be able to get that contentment that satisfaction at the end of the day uh, from the the work that you would do um, because passion sir will induce the learning by doing sir you would reap the benefit of it it's something like sir what in today's time we start calling about return on investment sir so you do work passionately sir the return of that passionate work is much more so you teach with passion the students will be rewarding you back sir you do sir policy dialogue with passion your policy reforms will happen sir 
i come here in a new country sir i meet the prime minister and the president and they immediately feel the passion sir that with which what i am talking about so to me sir that's a very important element of uh, doing well getting contentment and success will follow sir in whichever way we define success it will follow sir so that's my take on that sir thank you and uh, yes dr bahel yeah. yes sir too many things sir uh, in fact what i have learned from the discourse from sir is that challenges will be there <clears throat> and uh, what we used to learn in the autonomic nervous system in physiology fight or flee sir you had many many opportunities to flee but you always chose to fight and once you face the challenge there only the result comes there only the satisfaction and that is what we have proven and this is for all the audience to listen that either we work in out of the comfort zone or we don't work if you want to work you have to get out of the comfort zone or you just keep sitting in your room and become a laptop wall a doctor or you go to the field and get the results and so <clears throat> you have again repeatedly said that it's never impossible to achieve anything you have been achieving elimination of so many diseases in so many countries the size definitely matters but you have achieved and that is an example that is an example and uh, <clears throat> sir there are a few questions from a few audiences and uh, one question has cropped up just now it is from uh, dr satabdi mitra he said that with md plus post md 4 years experience are we directly eligible to apply for the post like consultant in certain organizations i mean is it sufficient to apply for the post of a cons uh, consultant uh sir what happens is actually for uh, any of the positions in any of the organizations be it uh, uh, multilateral like un and who or international agencies or national organizations they would actually articulate their requirements many a time for a consultant position uh, a master degree with a 2 to 3 experience could be sufficient as well but sometimes if they are looking into a senior consultant they might write 10 to 15 year plus experience kind or in a relevant area uh because if i am looking at uh, the question that dr mitra had said about uh, md and post md experience four plus four uh, the basically it is the generic experience that i am talking about there so if it is a generic broad experience and if my organizational requirement is that i need a broad consult broad generic public health management consultant i would certainly take it whether i mean i am not in india for a long time but i can say that organizations like national health system resource center for example or international agencies even like um, uh, what we used to call the usaid private voluntary organizations like psi care uh, path international gates foundation there would be many project or project specific positions where such Uh, experience could be good enough but there are consultant positions which would be very specific and like if i am looking into a consultant in health management information system and if i am looking into a senior consultant then i would specify that i would not say four year general public health experience but i would specify that that i need x many number of year of experience in health management uh, information system and then uh, one could apply for it for sure so actually the bottom line remains that as if you said in the beginning if the time mm -hmm. is not in your favor let the qualification be that you keep on lengthening your bio data i remember my late uh, teacher professor r k sachar had once told me that time i was uh, just a pg student he said never stop your bio data from lengthening it should keep on lengthening i think the same should be the message for our um, viewer also that you keep lengthening your bio data keep doing something and a suitable opportunity will definitely invite you and sir there is one more question one is very specific how to get into the international organizations like who uh so like i said that there is uh, there are huge number of opportunities sir in all organizations uh, in all uh, 
uh, you know, like specifically uh, nowadays, because there is this whole aspect of being transparent and being uh, uh, objectized in the recruitment. So all organizations, UN and WHO, we are now advertising our positions. There are variety. If you go to the WHO website, for example, even now, there is a career icon, career window, and you can look into it. Now, whether you fulfill those requirements or not, that's something which would be, as you said, your CV would speak, whether you get shortlisted or you don't get shortlisted. So <clears throat> most of these are through uh, open recruitment, open advertisements. Today, WHO Geneva, for example, headquarters, my regional office and country offices. Like, for example, we promote interns, internship from all developing countries and developed countries as well. Now, people may argue why I should join as an intern or as a UN volunteer because there is a separate organization. You would be surprised to know, sir, I receive intern like a mid-career professionals. I receive mid-career professional as UN volunteers. Uh, who have done like five years or 10 years of work, but they just wanted a break and they wanted to experience the multilateral environment and the way that the experience and the work. And many of them then can continue. And actually COVID-19 somewhere had proven to be more like an opportunity, had provided uh, such avenues for so many, so many people uh, that it has been possible for uh, people to join uh, international organization. Now, one need not to be outside the country to be in an international organization or in the global health. Your national issues are also affected by the international health. Pandemic, COVID-19 and monkeypox, fine example. So you would still be working in your own country. So I think in terms of how do we get into my suggestion would be uh, two, basically. One, keep your eyes and ears open, particularly looking into the, uh, the advertisement. Second, and which is very important, is networking and relationships. If you are attending any conference and if there is a colleague who is from any of the agencies, do meet, interact, talk to him or her and, you know, like be in touch. You would learn, you would, if you are visiting the Delhi office, if you are visiting Delhi or if you are visiting Mumbai or if you are visiting Guwahati and you have interacted with somebody from UNICEF Guwahati, go and meet up. I mean, you can send a message, you can write an email. Networking relationship helps. I receive uh, at least 10 or 20 or 30 emails uh, in a week, more than 100 sending people say, oh, you know, like I need, I, I want to join and all of that, which will not work. But yes, I would remember somebody who will keep, not to kind of um, uh, irritate me, but also important that that, that, that art and the skill of, uh, relationship is very, very critical and networking is very critical. One can certainly make the ways into organizations then. Simply means you don't have to just write mail or write a letter. It's better to be a go-getter. One should be a go-getter. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will, you have to grab the opportunities. Yeah, I will pitch in here, uh, Behel. I will pitch in here. At even my age, whenever I go to attend any conference, I attend the conference in totality. I attend all sessions. I meet with the people and uh, you have seen the result of networking yes, in sir. our governing council meeting. That yes. it is important to understand that these are the opportunities where you see you have your national conference or you have your public health conference where there are multiple sessions which are sponsored by multiple agencies. And now the number of agencies working in the field of health has tremendously increased. And you get all the opportunities in those conferences and you must interact with them and only then you will come to know what is required also. Because their requirement will be a bit different than what is being taught to you or what you are practicing. So these are the few things which are again important. Yes, very well. Any any other questions? Dr. Bell, I would, Dr. Chopra, one more thing because I see a question from uh, Dr. Manjula which says master's fellowships, in yes. public policy or health diplomacy. Uh, I saw a question in the Excel sheet as well, like which specific areas. You see, today's domain within public health also is getting more and more specialized. Uh, it certainly is very important for you to decide. Again, as I would reflect onto this, to say self-reflect, it's a challenge. 
are you up for a public diplomacy uh do you really want to get into it it's a very difficult domain it's a it's a terrain where we are talking about a large unknown not all the time successes it is looking into the whole dimension particularly when i look into these are the these are taught more in the field of masters in public health or the public health philosophies uh, given by hopkins or by harvards or by north carolina or by entrep in belgium or looking into some of the things nowadays in mahidol university in bangkok uh, or many of the uh, public health uh, institutions now uh, operating in india particularly the ones which are uh, affiliated with the uh, the international institute of health management and research or public health foundation of india because the importance of such domains public policy health diplomacy the the whole uh, dimension about um, uh the negotiation the art of uh, you know like uh, change management they are all new and these are something which is where you have to have your own knack and then you know like these universities these institutions these courses can offer you opportunities for sharpening your skills in terms of opportunities later on after one has completed this certainly yes as dr chopra you rightly said that there are many players today there are players who are only working at the level of policy there are players who are only working at the level of uh, donor management so the things are changing in the field of health so much and at a very very rapid pace so all these domains are very important i was referring to a question which said that which specific domain one needs to choose i think instead of uh, of course your teachers your trainers your facilitators would help you but ultimately it is your decision you decide which of the domain of the public health is really uh, coming for a passion for you do you want to go into clinical epidemiology you want to go into public health uh, management you want to go into the public policy in hospital management there are so many streams so many field research operational research translational research so you have to experiment as well again don't fear uh you know like and don't be scared if you say oh i have taken a wrong decision if you get into this public health is one field where you can always decide to say oh i have done enough of public policy i might probably come back to the mainstream public health and that's very much possible as well so the global health scenario is changing and is becoming so dynamic uh communication i said media management nobody teaches us in media nobody teaches us communication now i believe in the curriculum it is coming in but that's important those are critical things that we would need to choose when we are talking about uh, how do we and how do you as uh, faculty and as teachers help young people uh, the budding young public health professional choose the domain that the area uh, because we need scientists we need epidemiologists we also need biostatisticians we need hospital managers we need public health managers we need consultants at the district level who would actually help the public health program to be managed properly but it did not mean that that level that aspiration should not be there that i become a manager of a country later on but we need those people as well so it's something which we say that the basic health worker is needed as much as a super specialist is needed so public health has got that range and i think we need we have a responsibility to keep guiding our budding professionals accordingly and i think you have also answered the question which was asked a number of time it is asked <coughs> the the purpose of this human library project so so you have you have very happily answered that question the purpose is to broaden the vision of of people who are watching or who will be viewing later on on the youtube channel so that they understand and they can decide and they have to decide themselves nobody is there because we do not know what interest you most what is your passion so that you have to decide do a introspection decide and move forward and if you get the vision of so many countries <coughs> which are working in the field of public health of course all this they have not written in any book and of course if they write it will be a voluminous book you have to go for hours together to read all those things so that is one of the objective 
so that you get the insight and the experiences of the visionaries in the field. Yes, Dr. Rakesh, you wanted to ask something more? Yes, sir. But this is what you said that everything is not there in the books. You have to get out and learn in the world also. And sir, there are two more questions. Uh, one question is from a very senior person, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. He is professor and head of community medicine at uh, Vidisha. And his question is that early exposure of students regarding family adoption, is it really good or is it really going to make a difference? Like now we have in the curriculum, right from first prof, the families are being adopted by the first prof and the students. So his question pertains to that aspect, sir. Uh, let, me, let me give you a perspective, sir. I may not be able to command in the curriculum basis given the context of the India, but I tell you why to me, uh, area and the family and the location adoption is very important, sir. Uh, so one thing which is important uh, for us to understand as a young professional, as a first year MBBS student as well, we would be working in a, in a social milieu, sir. We are not necessarily being, uh, now of course we have that communication and interaction workshops as a part of curriculum maybe, but you cannot uh, all the time uh, uh, dictate or uh, lecture communication, sir. It is an art and a skill. And that needs to be absorbed. So the medicine is an art and science, sir. And same is the public health, sir. So to me, sir, family adoption gives an opportunity to one. I am coming from a family that is my family with, to whom I belong to. But if I am now working with the family to understand the family dynamics sir, and understand how the situation, how the issues, how they from the budgeting part of the family that influences my ability to access health services or not access health services sir. to the stresses that are there because of the dynamics that are happening in and around me as a family. The whole dimension about mental health aspect, somebody asked also that yeah. aspect. Then looking into the way that the uh, the entire health and nutrition status of the family can be influenced and, and can be can be uh, learned about the practices because ultimately sir there are two aspects we would be having an opportunity for an individual intervention and on the other side an early adoption and a learning about the family if i am really uh, really making that effort to learn and to work and to facilitate would tell me about how do I influence the family for behavioral changes and adoption of healthy lifestyles. So there are many aspects to me of a family adoption decision that may be there so that I start getting exposed to this environment at an earlier stage. Sir. Uh, the reason I'm sharing this and, and this perspective is, sir, like we deal and we are working in the field of school health in, say, in Timor-Leste as well. I've done this work, so we have looked into it. We were educating school children for adopting healthy behaviors. So on one side, there is a direct intervention and there is an indirect benefit that if I am asking the student not to allow smoking in and around the school environment, he or she is taking the same message back home and our secondhand smoking rates, the exposure to secondhand smoke got reduced drastically. So, same way, sir, in the family environment, we can look into what are the interventions that could have collateral benefits. Sir. So early adoption of the family, to me, also gives an opportunity to understand many interactions that take place, which would have either very positive or very negative effect in terms of the, family, the, life, the lifestyle that the young people may have, the children may have in the days to come. The challenge, of course, in the country context would be how this would remain supported. How do we support the family adoption? How and what we want out of it, sir? Is it somebody thought about it? Or is there a larger vision? Is there something? There are challenges working with the facilities itself, sir. So we are talking about a field practice area. And to me, sir, the field practice area need not to be 50 kilometers away, sir. If I am a medical college and I have a campus, I can do family adoption program there itself also. 
and i do an awareness program among the campus people and i say i am going to increase i am going to have we are now as part we are going to have a family adoption scheme and a program and would you volunteer while we expect the others in the rural in the urban slum areas them to be volunteering while in the compound we do not want to volunteer ourselves so to me it becomes a, it's a very important dimension one perspective to look at it because possibility as well that in the years to come there could be uh, also indication about family medicine and that debate i know could start community medicine family medicine why are we doing family adoption scheme is it to uh, kind of make it similar and all those but again sir there are so many things today when i am sitting here sir i am i get request at time uh, which are very unusual like if i as a who representative i have to support a support some construction now in my mbbs day sir we had a family manual which talked about elevation front elevation back elevation and all of those drainage i got familiar to those terminology sir now when a architect and consultant comes to me i am at least familiar with what the front facade is so family adoption i think at an early stage to me could be beneficial if it is really implemented well with a clear vision of the outcome we want not just that okay we have to do psm so do family adoption so you, that's something which is what i would share as a perspective from my side sir so much sir because this answer is very important because uh, there's a lot of doubt in the minds of so many of us and i think your this uh, statement clears the air of doubt <clears throat> among the minds of all of us because uh, with a new whenever new thing is there people always suspect it and since the new inclusion policy has been made that uh, first of students would be taking up the family they are taking so many of us who had been raising doubts about it i think they will definitely get satisfied and uh, there are many questions sir but in fact uh, during the discourse itself all the questions have been answered so i don't find there's a need to re retake uh, retaking up them because you have answered most of the questions have gone much beyond that also so thank you so much sir for all that support and uh, being so open to everything sir thank you so absolutely much. a pleasure i i saw one question if you allow me from some yeah. dr yeah. jadhav this one more is uh, yes so dr jadhav says about uh, the top 3 to 5 skills on a public health graduate um, should have at the first place to have an edge over others yes sir uh, first one you are in public health it's an edge over anybody else <laughs> no other fraternity you can say it's my bias to my fraternity but i feel uh, no other fraternity provides the kind of learning than it does an opportunity to work at different levels you have to capitalize on that and certainly your question is correct you need to have certain unique skills uh you know like there are many that comes to my mind competencies as we call as a mix of skill ability and the knowledge so we need to have communication as i've been repeatedly saying communication is a very important uh, competency that we need to possess uh, it is practiced uh, the best orators in the world including dr chopra uh, are the most well rehearsed uh, speakers so be assured on that so communication is the first one uh the second that i would say and i tried to reflect on to it actually was the uh, the flexibility and adaptability uh i gave an example when i said that i was actually on under the tree in one day and visiting with the politicians on the other day on a decision making table in a five star hotel so that flexibility and adaptability is very important i might need to go to the rural area i might need to work in five years in some setting i worked in north korea for 5 years uh i can have a separate session with send many of you or some of you if you are interested because these are important aspect to me competency of flexibility and adaptability is very very critical a uh, third i would say not in any order uh, as i said is your ability to relate with you know like people the interpersonal relationships the networking um uh, is critical because that makes uh, and break things and makes and breaks your entry uh, into a particular field into a particular domain um is very very uh, important skill the fourth one dr jadhav i could say um is the competency of uh, uh, analy being analytical 
and uh, using that analysis for uh, the right purpose, like say for advocacy. I think that ability, that skill, that competency is very, very critical uh, because that would give you an edge that you could, if there is a discussion with a high level uh, technical team and you could analyze and decipher and interpret the key message and are able to then use it for an advocacy, for a policy reform. Uh, I always call and give an example of my experience of maternal death review that we introduced in Tamil Nadu that led to many reforms. And I gave that as review to reforms because we could analyze through that review some very important aspect that led to a whole reform of administration and human resources in Tamil Nadu. So that is a very important competency that we need to, we need to have. Uh, I don't know whether that's a competency or not, but the, the one uh, important thing I, I always feel links with what Dr. Chopra said uh, as well, which is self-belief, self-confidence and passion. You know, just build on to that as a competency and you will have an edge uh, with fellow public health colleagues, but also, you know, like with any of the fraternity, uh, because the rest of the things, you know, you would have to be a multitasker, you would have to be looking into planning, you would have to be, um, you know, like uh, giving attention to detail, all of those would come naturally. But to me, these, you know, like four or five uh, are the ones which you are able to uh, harness, you would have all of them, just harness them that would actually make things um, you know, like much easier. And the last but not the least would be for me, um, you know, like in the growing time, uh, two that I would mention um, as a passing one, but they're very critical and important. One is actually the IT skills. Uh, I mean, in today's world, without the IT competencies, we just cannot uh, survive. So one is the IT, IT skills. <coughs> And the last one is, again, uh, an aptitude and attitude is for problem solving. I think we as public health practitioners need to focus on solutions after we have identified problem. What happens is we always identify problem and leave it. If you really want to be a successful practitioner, make sure that you have the attitude and attitude to try and make the problem solving the, the solution. Sometimes it will be there. Many times it may not be there. There is nothing, no mistakes. There is always learning. And with the right intent, if we are doing that, that would always pay dividend. Sometimes it is very important to learn what we will not be doing or what should not be done. And those lessons are very important. And COVID had told us and given us those huge lessons. So that's why I'm saying problem solving as one of the very, very important competency that we as public health practitioners need to have in us. I think I will just say that five or six uh, probably would suffice. Um, and uh, there are, of course, many more that uh, one would have to have, uh, and you would have them already. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. In fact, sir, uh, frankly speaking, I have prepared my own notes listening to you, whether I'm ready with the lecture for my students also. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So many things we are learning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, so, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. And uh, thank you, Arvind. And uh, I will say a few things which, which are there in my mind and I keep on repeating. As a, as a public health, there are three C's, five C's which are very, very important. And probably you have touched that. I always say that you need to have the concepts clear. You need to have the concepts clear for, the, for that. You have to read a lot. And you, you mentioned that you have to do a lot of courses. And just for the benefit of the viewers, I'm reminding you, Arvind has been our very, very dear student also. And uh, the, the, the amount of books, the kind of books which he read in the departmental library, I think nobody till date has been able to cross the figure of the book which he got from the departmental library for his readings. So that is, the so concept has to be clear. And then the, once your concepts are clear, you have to work in the field so that you develop the conviction that whatsoever mm -hmm. you are doing is correct. And once you develop that conviction, 
then you develop the courage courage to say that yes what is being done is right or not right because you have to look into when we talk of public health when we talk of programs when we say and and we are we we still uh, going on with the indicators which are not changing so there is something wrong with the program either at the technical level or at the implementation level or at the uh, utilization level something is there so you should have the courage and once you develop the courage then you have to develop the communication skill because you have to communicate it in a right manner never say that you have committed this mistake we say we have learned the lesson rather <clears throat> and we are going not going to repeat this particular thing again and again and so on so these are the few take up uh, my my points on that and i am really thankful to arvind for uh, giving his time i know it must be quite late there in the morning stay it must be around 11 o'clock or something like that but here we are extremely thankful to you and uh, your <laughs> deliberations again remind me of two lines by while in all the deliberations you gave lot of respect to your teachers and 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 to everyone so there are two lines with which we would like to finish uh, this particular interaction and uh, these are uh, dedicated to uh, once again to arvin and they go like this ki sant tarash ne patthron ko tarasha hai is tarah ki sant tarash ne patthron ko tarasha hai is tarah ki patthron ne ghabra kar ajantas ugal diya so with this uh, we 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 say goodbye to every one of you hope uh, those who have attended have been benefited and those who will be watching later on on youtube will be benefited and uh, whenever we get an, another opportunity we will be inviting him again for his vast experiences which he has uh, got in the pr korea or maldives or in bangladesh or in the fiero or in the india office uh, he has done almost everything uh, as far as i am concerned i have been following him for a for a, for a pretty long period of time right from 1985 or so and he has been so dear and near to me and uh, uh, hats off to you and thank you so much for giving your extremely valuable time for this interview thank you so much god bless you stay safe and stay healthy and keep on doing the good job which you are doing in the field of public health so with this we come to the uh, end of this session thank you and faraz you can stop the live streaming now thank you so very much sir it's been really an honor and a pleasure um, i remain available for everyone any time uh, with this i would be more than happy to interact and continue my interaction uh, thank you for this opportunity it just been uh, very 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 uh, enriching for me to interact with you with have some brilliant questions my very best wishes to all of uh, the colleagues and thank you for uh, thank you thank you for this great initiative sir so keep up the great work and thank you uh, to faraz uh, for making this happen as well we really appreciate uh, this kind of support that is there so thanks a lot Uh, we are very glad to have you all in our platform sir clarnet sir thank, thank you, you so much sir for thank that. you thank you and good night everyone and good can night can we start uh, we are stopping the recording also sir okay good night